The reality is winners are winners, losers are losers. That's just the truth. Some people are just built winners and some people are built losers. I believe that some people just unconsciously worship the devil. That's really what it is. I believe that when you're a loser, it's because you unconsciously worship the devil. You unconsciously worship death. You just love death. That's what you love at your core. You like poverty. You like death. You like negativity. You like smallness. You like contraction. That's just what it is. And if you're somebody who likes prosperity, wealth, happiness, travel, having fun, being your best, if you love that, you're always gonna bounce back. Like, imagine me, no matter, like, imagine all the things that could be done to me. Imagine, like, put the list in your mind, all the horrible, horrible things, right? And, and, and you could do, you could just like, put me in like a torture chamber for 20 years. And I'm gonna come out, and I'm gonna be smiling, and I'm gonna keep on living. Because it's just the mental wiring in the brain. Some people just worship Satan, and some people don't, right? Don't, make no mistake about it. When you see somebody broke, and complaining, and just sitting there being a loser, that's because they unconsciously worship the devil. They like death. When I say the devil, I don't mean like the cartoon, like the horn, like, eh, hey, I'm the devil, and God's like the guy with the beard, like up in the clouds. I'm talking about an energy that exists in the world. What is the energy of life and creation and expansion? The other is the energy of death and decay and contraction. What is a light, playful, fun energy? The other is a dense, negative, heavy energy. And some people, you're just like, you know what? You know what I wanna do? I just wanna make millions of dollars. I wanna hook up with people I'm attracted to or have a great significant other. I just wanna travel. I wanna go in nature. I wanna live in a fat crib. I wanna have fun. I wanna laugh with my friends. I wanna do work I'm passionate about. I wanna, I, I don't wanna complain. I don't wanna, com I, I wanna go months at a time without being mad. I wanna go months at a time without complaining. I wanna go months at a time without being in a bad mood. I don't wanna be sick. I just wanna have fun. I wanna laugh. I wanna hang out with my kids. I wanna have awesome kids. I wanna bring my kids with me to work like you guys see me. But the point being, why is that? My kids have never seen me in a bad mood. My kids have never seen me sick. They never see me broke. They never see me complaining. Well, how would that even happen? Right, why? Because I'm not worshiping Satan. So, okay, and I'm saying, I'm saying this to you in a dramatic way to just try to make it clear in your mind, right? And by the way, I've had a lot of blowback on this. You know, people will say to me like, you know, it's okay to like complain about things and you know, to be angry and da, da, da. I'm like, okay, look, some of that is a healthy emotion to a degree. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a evolutionary response to whatever degree. So I understand that, but why are you limiting yourself? I'll set up Tristan today, Dylan. I'll set up Tristan. Come here, Tristan. Yeah. <laughs> Wanna hop up here? Up. Up. Stand up. Now say hi. 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 Say hi. 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 Say I'm Tristan Cook. Tristan Cook. Yes. Say hi to Tristan Cook, guys. Hi. Meet your future leader. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, say, I'm going to be the president. I'm president. <laughs> say, I'm, I'm going to be the president. Uh, I'm going to be president. Yes. Tell him, give him a hand, guys. <laughs> okay, you can fall him out. Go there. Okay. There you go, buddy. Go see Dylan, okay? So that's, that's, how, that's what happens um, and look, I don't know what's gonna happen with my kids when they get older, right? Unfortunately, you only have so much influence with your kids. I, I think it's about a third, right? I mean, come on, how much influence do your parents have on you? All you can do is make the right foundation. You're, you know, when, when your kids get offered their first joint in the ninth grade or seventh grade these days or whatever it is, you know, it's their choice if they wanna smoke it. If they, you know, if they, uh, you know, wanna make bad life decisions, you know, get in that stolen car or whatever else, well, you know, things happen, right? You can't control every little thing. I can't, I can't live my kids for them. But what I can do is I can set the best foundation that I can, which is basically they don't listen to what you say, they look at what you do. And so as a grown adult, what can you ultimately do? Basically just be a living role model for them. So understand when I'm saying things like, okay, remember I said that some people eat the cow, they go to eat the poop. Some people eat the cow, they go to eat the hoof. Some people go to eat the cow, they want the ribeye. They, you know, what, what are the other good pieces? The New York steak, what's the other one? The, uh, yeah, the liver, I guess, right, is what they say these days. I gotta get into that. So, right, so basically what it is, some people want what's called the prime cut. Say the word prime cuts. Prime cut. So in other words, like, and the prime cut 
in life exists everywhere. It just exists everywhere. And some people get it and other people don't. Some people get it, other people don't. You either want the best of the best of the best that life has to offer, or you probably just want the garbage and the crap. And that's up to you how you feel about it. And that is gonna be something that you vote on every single day with how you spend your time. And that's where you put your thought capital, your emotional capital, your time capital, what you view your time as being worth to you. So people that get into things like gossip or trash talking or things like smoking weed or things like taking drugs or things like drinking alcohol, getting obsessed. What is it that they really believe about themselves? That their time is worthless, that, they, uh, that their brain is worthless. Have you guys seen the Andrew Huberman episode on cannabis or maybe Dr. Amen's uh, content on cannabis. Dr. Amen, this poor man, and I, I've had to start spreading this because weed is just getting too popular. It's just getting too popular. So I've, I've got to get the word out about this. So I've been putting this in the videos more often. So you have to indulge me if you heard me saying it already. Poor Dr. Amen, the guy who's done the most brain scans in the world, sees that cannabis is getting viewed as a health food. And poor Dr. Amen's like, uh, guys, um, I've done the most brain scans in the world, guys. Um, could you guys please look at the brain scan here? And everyone's like, Weed, yeah, party, right? He's like, guys, I, I don't mean to be a killjoy, but uh, you know, your little two glasses a day of wine does this to your brain, and you know, the weed does this to your brain, and, and there's just like holes in the damn brain scan. Okay, you remember the 80s when people went to jail for weed? That was evil. The people that put people in jail for weed in the 80s should go to jail themselves. You shouldn't go to jail for eating a Cheeto. You shouldn't go to jail for smoking a joint. But just because you shouldn't go to jail for smoking a joint doesn't mean that you're eating a freaking health food, okay? And I meet these idiots that'll be like, I'm getting into health food. I'm like, or into health. I'm like, really, tell me about your, your, your health journey. Like, I got into cannabis. I'm like into cannabis. And I got my friends into cannabis. It's like the miracle plant. It's amazing, right? Yes, it's called a miracle plant for end of life care. Or if you're a caveman and you broke a bone or something and you're in severe pain, it's a great alternative to opioids or things like that, okay? So it shouldn't be illegal and it has medicinal functions. But the problem is you're taking something that should either be viewed as an incredibly rare celebration or as something with a medicinal function and you're using it as a day-to-day -day habit until your brain rots out. And I can't tell you how many friends I've lost to hallucinogens and how many friends I've lost to weed because they either become some lame burnout that I don't want to talk to anymore or they get so untethered from reality, they're like, hey man, yeah. Have you tried the DMT yet? Right? I'm like, do you ever talk about anything else than this? They're like, oh, hey, man, ayahuasca, yeah, journey, shrooms, right? I'm like, bro, you used to be so cool. Like, no, I'm now next level cool. You need to do the ayahuasca. I'm like, can we talk about anything else, please? Not until you get your foundation right, man. You gotta expand your mind, man. Yeah, bro, so you could be like me. My brain hasn't been hijacked by the spirit of the ayahuasca and it's like all that I talk about is like still in me running me. No, I'm enlightened right now. Oh wait, I got a parking ticket. Damn it, damn it, damn it. Take ayahuasca, be enlightened like me. Right, so. Now look at that, right? They still have anger issues. They still get pissed off, but they're telling you to go fry your brain. They get mad about the parking ticket. They, get, they, they, they yell in front of their kids, but they're telling you they, they, they don't have very much creativity. And it's like, you know what would help you? The creativity? Yeah, man, the plant ceremony. You're gonna finally have your, learn to be creative and stuff, right? I'm like, wow, thank you for my, for the, that's what I need is help with my creativity. Thank you, right? And it, it's one of these things where, okay, where guess what? There's no shortcut, there's no easy way out. What does enlightenment look like when done sober? What does it look like when done through hallucinogens? Sober enlightenment, there's a clear grounding there. It's like a tree, it's grounded, and then the person has the capacity for presence, the capacity for lateral thinking, the capacity for creativity, capacity for being outside the box, but they're grounded. Okay, people that take a lot of hallucinogens, they have this, but they often don't have this. Some hallucinogens provide a negative experience, which does create the roots to an extent. It actually will create roots because you have a bad trip and then you have the good trip and blah, and all this kind of stuff. But basically what happens is that it's more or less this kind of pagan type ritual. And it's, it's doing a number of different things that are a problem. For example, don't just view yourself as God. You have to view God as outside yourself. You, are, you have a spark of God in you, the way that there's maybe a sun and then a ray comes down, you've got a little ray inside of you, but that's, that doesn't mean that you're God. And so get that straight in your head because that one single distinction is probably the most important one in the entire thing. Now, 
Okay? Because that means that you're in surrender. You're not, you're not worshiping yourself. Okay? Look at the book of Exodus when it says, don't worship the golden calf. That's called idolatry. When you're sitting there looping in your mind about me, 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 it's me. 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 I'm hot. I'm cold. I'm horny. I'm hungry. I'm mad. I want to be cool. I want to be cool. I want to be cool. They don't think I'm cool. F them. F them. I'm so cool. And so on and so forth. That's you doing idolatry on yourself, which creates mental density, a collapse of the mind. So don't allow yourself to make yourself into an idol. You should love yourself, respect yourself, make money, crush it, have a great life, but don't just make yourself into an idol. Don't just sit there staring at social media and making social media into an idol. Don't make your significant other into an idol. So what I'm talking about connecting to the energy of life and not being a Satan worshiper, what I'm saying is that you're not connecting to something other than the energy of life. You're not connecting to something other than the energy of life. Now, by the way, I know there's guys in here that have done a lot of crazy, wild drug trips, and you're thinking, does that mean I have a problem now? No, you're fine, but when you're digging a hole, stop digging, okay? When you're digging a hole, stop digging, okay? How do you actually have that kind of eye-opening, enlightening experience sober? I'll talk about that today. So some people want the ribeye, some people want the crap, they just wanna eat the poop out of the animal, and a lot of people are in between. So in life, what you say to yourself is, what is the ribeye with everything? What is the prime cut with everything? Repeat after me. What is the prime cut with everything? It's just with everything, okay? With everything. So in other words, look, you wanna think about it like this. Let's say that you're out at a bar or a club, okay? And you're sitting out there and you have a, you have a menu of options. What is the ribeye at a bar or club? Like understand that for me, why I take the action that I take is because I just want the ribeye. That's it, that's all that I'm thinking. I want the ribeye, the metaphorical ribeye. What is, what is the prime cut at a bar club? Number one, you're gonna go talk to freaking everybody. Number two, you're gonna have hella fun. You're gonna have the most fun ever. Number three, the people that are the most intimidating, you're gonna go and you're gonna, let's, let's get people coming in through the back please, but you're fine, just do it quick though, okay? Yeah, you could maybe lock that one. So then going from there, then what you have is you are gonna go meet those people that most would be intimidated by, okay, why? because you go for the prime cut. So you're in, the, you're in the venue and your brain is saying, what is the appropriate response here? Repeat that after me. So you're in a club, what's the appropriate response? To kill it, to have fun, to meet the best people. That's what you do. That's what you do. That's how you optimize that moment. Now, let's say that you're out in nature, okay? How do you optimize that moment? What's that? In, if you're in nature, the way that you optimize that moment is you realize I'm here to spiritually recharge. You get hella present. You look at the nature. You take it in. You allow that energy to infuse you. Joke with your friends. Maybe get a couple photos, right? But you, you take it in. You don't sit there complaining. You don't sit there gossiping. You don't sit there staring at your phone. Staring at your phone in beautiful moments means that you're somebody who's addicted to eating the poop. That's all it is. All that is, it's nothing other than that. It's just you saying, this is a beautiful moment. I can't resonate with consuming something this awesome. This is just too awesome. I cannot deal with it. I need to eat the poop. That's all it is. That's all it is. So same thing with money, right? Say that you're making less cash and you're like, well, you know, I work at this crap nine to five and it sucks and I hate it. Well, it, all that that is, is a reflection that you're eating the poop. That's it, you're just doing the poop job, that's your standard, right? Somebody like myself, if you were to rewind me today and quantum leap me into the body of somebody who had, you know, nine kids, husbands left me, not giving me a dime, and basically I've gotta, I've gotta hustle it out at some horrible job to feed my nine kids after my husband abandoned me. And I basically only have about maybe 45 minutes free per day in order to actually try to find some other line of income, okay? I would be in that situation and immediately I would be, first of all, so incredibly angry to be in that situation. Then the next thing that I would do is I would be like a trapped rat trying to find a way out of that situation. Like a trapped rat. Now you can say to me, Owen, you've never been in that situation. Huh, what? 
uh, what? Uh, what? How about autism, no social skills, and me saying, and no ability to meet somebody, and to be honest, quite a horny person. And so literally, I'm just being honest with you, and so literally what you have, and I'm like, I can't meet anybody. I hate this. This completely sucks. And so as a result of that, what I said to myself, okay, my kid's out of the room, by the way, when I said that. Now, as a, okay, people at home, they're like, is a kid up there? Okay. So as a result of that, um, I said, this is not tolerable. Like, this situation is absolutely intolerable to me. I'm not going to live like this. So I said, I'm going to do whatever it takes. How many times do you think our business got hammered when the Julian thing happened or things like that? COVID happened when we run a seminars company, we need to be out in bars and clubs. What do you think that does to me? Do you understand the degree to which I've been hammered down again and 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 again? Happened to me countless times. I've had so many different possibilities of just giving up and saying, okay, I'm gonna throw in the towel. All that happens is that when I get beat down like that, my brain starts working faster, thinking faster. I kind of get more angry. Did you guys notice like in the last five years, I kind of just talk fast and I just look angry? I'm not proud of that, okay? But that happened because my brain, I got put in so many horrible situations um, when I had to switch out from, from dating to self-help. Viciously hard. Then right after I finished that successfully, lockdown, viciously hard. But I just accelerated my thinking. I got, like, I got to the point that I'd be sitting there and people would be talking to me and I'd just go, talk faster, talk faster. You're talking too slow, talk faster. And then literally, because I had no time, and then I'd be at the point where I'm like, I'm like, okay, now go, right? And then I would just literally just sit there calculating things, figuring things out, producing results. And I just did that. And I stayed in that pocket right from the end of the dating stuff until we landed the plane in self-help and rebuilt the business. And then again, I stayed in that pocket during COVID. Again. So I've had to stay in that pocket. But what is not acceptable to me is eating the poop, eating the hoof. No, you're either a ribeye eater or you're not. You're either somebody who says it is intolerable to me that I don't have awesome things in life of what I want. It doesn't have to be a giant yacht. It's just whatever awesome is for you. It's either intolerable or it's not, okay? Like a simple example, all me guys that haven't had an intimate physical experience, you know, in months or years, I don't get that. If that was me and, and that happened to me, what do you think I would do? I'll, I'll leave that to your imagination, okay? But basically, I would socialize and socialize and socialize and socialize. I will social, okay? I will never go more than 24 hours without that. That just doesn't happen. And, and, and it has to be someone I'm really attracted to. Like someone I am really, 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 really attracted to. So it can't be somebody I'm, I'm settling on, okay? It has to be with somebody who I'm very into, somebody who I'm very excited by, and every day. The odd time if I'm super busy, maybe not every day. Usually two or three times a day. That's normal to me, okay? I also eat grass-fed ribeye steaks almost every day, so I actually eat the ribeye, okay? You know, like I wanna live somewhere that I like living. I wanna, I, I wanna have a job that I find rewarding or that I find exciting. That it's just a basic level personal standard, okay? And it's the same thing, if I come in here and I'm doing public speaking, I wanna bring a lot of energy. You know, people might watch this on a video, they don't realize how much energy we've been putting in this entire weekend. And I'm gonna bring energy no matter what it is that I do. I do many different types of speaking, many different styles. This is like the more bitch slap kind of style of speaking. I do joking speaking, chilled speaking. But you know, this version, we're doing the, the kind of bitch slap type of delivery. So that's what I'm bringing to you now, right? It's a certain type of, of uh, con conceptual teaching method. So it's a basic level understanding that you don't eat the crap. Your time is valuable. And you have a basic level standard of how you're gonna live. And then if you start to go below that standard, you start getting mentors, you start hiring mentors, you start getting peer groups, you start coaching other people on it, and you focus on it until you fix that particular area. And, you just, and, and your thinking speeds up, and your intention increases, and your urgency increases, okay? So say, speed of thinking, say that. Speed of Intention. Intention. Urgency. Urgency. Lateral thinking. Lateral thinking. Seeking, out external resources. Seeking out external resources. Mentors. Mentors. Hustle. Hustle. So basically what I do is I just have a basic way that I like to live. And then anytime that I go outside that sweet spot, 
I just start thinking faster, working harder, getting mentors, looking up resources, and then I just keep going OCD on that topic until I get what it is that I want. Now, a lot of people say, well, is that spiritual? Because I teach ideas like meditation. I teach ideas like you shouldn't need a certain amount of money. I teach all that stuff, right? Remember what I always teach. The core of my teaching is what? Intent plus freedom from outcome, and that we are that intermediary point. So in other words, today, we might even do a little bit of spiritual teaching. We'll see what it is that we want to teach. But one component of it is this. Now, here's the key. Why is it that the spiritual community has to put on this freaky, creepy, weird um, image where somebody who's spiritual walks in the room, and I love Eckhart Tolle, by the way, and he does this, but I love him. Um, I saw him recently on a, at an event. But you know, they walk in, and then they go, and everyone's like, oh, yes, oh, the white robe. Ah, 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 ah. Right? And by the way, these are the same tire kickers when they get the parking ticket as the people that, I, that do the hallucinogens. They're tire kickers, right? Ah, a ticket. Ah! Okay, they flip out. You know why? Because if you're actually spiritual and you actually are grounded and you're actually present, you shouldn't be afraid of hard work because there's no different from difference from meditation and hard work. There's no actual, oh, you have non-dual awareness. Oh, 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 non-dual awareness. Okay, well then do that and get something done. But I remember, uh, there's that, you, we're from LA here, right? You guys all know Erewhon? Okay, so they have these like magical smoothie bar at Erewhon. Okay, you guys ever been there? The smoothie, it's like these like $25 smoothies, $30 smoothies, has herbs in it and stuff. Okay, so these were invented by this old crew of people into herbs and into spiritual growth at, at Erewhon, right? And I remember Erewhon got bought out and um, they, they were bought out and, um, you know, the new management came in and the people who would do the spiritual ice creams at the Erewhon tonic bar, it's actually a great group of people that I really, really like and admire. And one of them, his name is, and, he, and he's like, is it, and, he, and he's an awesome guy, right? I, I freaking love him, man. I mean, I, I go, I literally would go to the tonic bar. He'd make me a tonic. The guy's a freaking genius. I love him, right? But the thing is, I got to admit it. Man, he's hella freaking slow, bro. Like that guy would take, you remember, man, this guy would take 90 minutes to get you freaking ice cream, right? I asked the manager, I'm like, where'd you go? And he's like, bro, I get it. You're the truth. You're the light. You're the galaxy, bro. Now, can you get the ice cream out in less than 45 minutes? I know you're the, the truth and the light and the galaxy. Can you take less than 45 minutes for ice cream? And I had to crack up because truth is the man. I love truth. But like, there is something to that, right? It's like, I am the truth. Oh, can you get me the ice cream? No. <laughs> it's just like, right? So it's like, and I'm teasing, right? I'm teasing. But the point being, you can be spiritual and still get things done, right? The argument against making money, if you're spiritual, is this idea that um, mo making money is driven by ego and driven by a false identity. So you don't know who you are. You have this empty vacuum inside your soul, and then you fill up this fake vacuum with narcissistic supply and grandiosity by making a bunch of cash and achieving things. Or maybe you, you fill up that hole by dating people that are very attractive. Or maybe you fill up that hole by traveling the world and climbing a mountain. But do you see how quickly this devolves from the joys of life, like the great joys of life, where you're not being some passive loser and you're actually enjoying the world that God created for us. And they take that behavior and they say the only way that you could possibly want to do that is if you just have a dark hole inside you, right? Like the only way, the only way that you could want to go make a couple million dollars is because you have an empty little uh, schizoid core inside your soul. That's the only way that you'd ever want to go make money. Oh, you just find living in a hamster cage in a city to be unsatisfying and boring? Oh, well, you know what it means if you're easily bored. That's a sign that you have a mental problem because you're easily bored, you little narcissist. Oh, you're easily bored? No, you should just learn to have joy in the simple things in life, like working your damn job for your boss and being a peon in the system. That'll show your emotional health and that you're
spiritual, oh, that'll show it, right? Yeah, just shut up and be your little spiritual chode. Wear your little robe. Be a little hamster in the cage. Be a little battery in the system. Then you can show that you're spiritual. Then you can show that you're mentally healthy. Then you can show that you're getting the finer things in life. Yeah, you know what it's all about? The little things, those little granular moments, like having dinner with your kids. Yeah, you know where I wanna have dinner with my kids? In Glacier Park, Montana, okay? So I don't give a f about that. So I don't wanna have dinner with my kids in the same boring apartment every single day, except the bare minimum so that they'll go to school and I'm gonna get them out of school as much as I can. I wanna have dinner with my kids in Jackson Hole, inside of a gondola, going up a mountain, and then blasting down the mountain. Does that, does that mean like, Oh, but wait, but if that's true, then how can you like Eckhart Tolle? Because Eckhart Tolle, you said you're a fan of him, you know, and it's like, he just on the park bench. What Eckhart Tolle is personally, is a very, very unique individual whose life's journey is to sit on the park bench for like half his life, and then the other half of his life is to do the videos, okay, and it's to do the seminars. That's a very, very unique individual. Eckhart Tolle is my favorite all-time contemporary teacher. I go to every event of his that I can. I'm literally so much on the dick of Eckhart. I'm, I, I will go gay for Eckhart any day this week. I don't even like girls anymore. I just like Eckhart Tolle, okay? Call me, Eckhart, call me, okay? I go to every Eckhart event. I'm literally like, 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 I'm literally sitting outside his trailer, like waiting there, hoping to get backstage. I'm like, what do I need to do, Eckhart? What do I need to do to get backstage with Eckhart Tolle, okay? I read your book hundreds of times, Eckhart. I talked about you creepishly in all your seminars. I literally study you 24 hours a day. I reread your book. I love you, Eckhart. What do I need to do to get it in with you, my man? What do I gotta do, okay? I'm sick of Instagram models. I'm sick of going to the club. I want a spoon. I want to be the little spoon, okay? I want to be the little spoon for Eckhart Tolle, okay? Is that wrong? Is that wrong? No, why can't, why can't that happen? Okay, why not? Why can't I be the little spoon with Eckhart Tolle, okay? <laughs> so, <clears throat> the, next, the next misquote in the media. So, okay. So, except in the media these days, you won't get canceled. I'm like, I go gay for Eckhart. They're like, oh, that's so courageous. So, so, okay, so I love Eckhart Tolle. Okay, I've reread Power of Now hundreds of times. I read the Bible, and you guys will freak out by this, often an hour to two hours a day. It's my favorite book. The Gospels are my favorite. I reread it all the time. And people don't even understand the Gospels. Maybe I'll do a seminar on that. People just read the Gospels like as if it's just like they said a historical document, like all this kind of stuff. They're not even getting the esoteric components behind it. It's a highly difficult to understand, highly esoteric text. It takes years to understand it. It's my favorite book. So going back from that, okay, people have no clue what they're even looking at when they read that. They're clueless. They're like, that's not true. Ha ha ha, you believe that? Ha ha. Man, I'm smart. It's a highly esoteric text about life and about your state of consciousness and about your soul. And I'd urge everybody to try to take time to understand it. Now, from that standpoint, again, the reason I'm making these jokes is because another thing that I believe is something that they do in Zen teaching. Zen teaching, one thing that I learned from that is a Zen teacher doesn't just give you the answer. The Zen teacher will talk in riddles, sarcasm, jokes. Zen teacher, you ask him a question, sometimes he'll just take his stick and smack you in the head. That's his answer. You're like, master, how do I learn this? He's like, smack, and he just smacks you in the head. And that's his answer. And because that's a basic thing called a pattern interrupt. What I'm saying, I'm gonna go gay for Eckhart. What am I doing? Pattern interrupt. Uh, okay, what am I doing? Pattern interrupt. Pattern. Guys, wake the f up. If I say I'm gonna go gay for Eckhart, does that really mean I'm going gay for Eckhart? Yes. Oh. Yes. Okay. Okay, what am I doing? What's that called? What's that? Okay, what is the big beard meant to be? Hiding my ball. No, pattern interrupt. Okay, not working. Okay, pattern interrupt. Okay. So, when it, okay, when I wear bright clothing, when I speak loud, when I change my cadence, when I make jokes, when I make sarcastic jokes, when I say things that I'm not serious about, what am I trying to do to you? I'm trying to do a pattern interrupt, right? When I talk about eating the poop versus the ribeye, what am I doing to you? Okay, so it's basic. I'm trying to get you, I'm trying to break you out of your autopilot days and I'm, I'm trying to interrupt that process. So Zen teachers, a lot of what it is that they do is they're trying to go smack 
and break the pattern trap. Okay, back in the day when I used to put out a lot of real life interaction footage, my main goal with that was to do things that were meant to interrupt your pattern. It was meant to see this little lightly autistic balding ginger running through the streets acting the fool. And you'd see that and it would interrupt your pattern. That was really my core intention with all of it. So even being in this room, right? What is it that we're actually building in this room right now at a meta level? What is it? New batteries. New batteries. Okay. Now, by the way, I can tell how much you're snapping into alertness, even when I just ask you basic questions, right? How much are you derping out in, in a daze? And I'll ask you little questions and I'll see how quickly you're, you're kind of snapping to attention. So now let's go back. Okay. So let's go and we'll go back for a second. So we talked about wanting the ribeye in life. So you want to basically go into any situation. You want to say to yourself, what is the actual value in this situation? So for example, and, and, and you want to be somebody who sees through the BS and okay. So quick lesson here. Okay. You see through the BS and you see through the facade, the highest level people, they see through the BS and they see through the facade at the highest friggin' level. Okay. So let me give you an example. I've given this example before. Here would be an example of seeing through the BS and seeing through the facade, okay? So when you think of a nightclub, a lot of people will say, oh, nightclubs suck. I don't know if I want to go to a nightclub or whatever, whatever, right? A nightclub is not a nightclub. A nightclub is not a nightclub. A nightclub is a free lead base. That's all that a nightclub is. It's just a free lead base. That's all that it is, okay? So basically, a couple hundred years ago, a bunch of crazy mofos, took a boat from Europe to get here. Then they killed a bunch of natives, which is disgusting. Then they fought their way over to the West Coast. They started building cities, built the giant city. They built the malls. They built the infrastructure. After they built the infrastructure, then more infrastructure came, and then eventually they built nightclubs. Some owner out there took a large, large, large financial risk to build that nightclub, not knowing if they'd go bankrupt. Some of them, which do go bankrupt, but, they, but the ones that didn't, uh, you know, took those odds. Then what they did was they hired club promoters. An average club promoter is probably contacting like, like hundreds of different attractive people to be able to show up at the club with 15 or 20 of them. And then that club might have, you know, a handful of different club promoters so that you can go there and you can walk in and you can complain and you can say that clubs suck. That is the sequence of events of things that had to happen so that you could go there and be a complainer. That's all that a club is. So a club, what that means is that if you want to meet people, you can now walk in there. Let's say the average club has about 100 to 200 attractive people and you can walk in with your phone and you can go say hi to everybody. And in under two hours, you can know almost every single person there briefly. And then you can quickly exchange contact information. And out of those 200 people, there's probably going to be like a small handful that you could be friends with and who could maybe provide you with social proof at your parties. And then you're going to have a tiny amount that are probably attracted to you who you might want to date. And of the ones that you want to date, an even lesser amount you're going to be intimate with and an even lesser amount you're going to make into a solid relationship. It's a basic level funnel. That's all that a nightclub really is. So you have to view a nightclub as basically just a lead funnel. I also break down human beings at their core value of what it is that they actually are. Okay, so when I look, let's take Eckhart Tolle, okay, my boyfriend. So <laughs> when my boyfriend Eckhart Tolle, when I look at him, what is Eckhart Tolle? I don't, Eckhart is not Eckhart, just like a nightclub is not a nightclub. You've got to, you've got to see through the facade and break down what the thing actually is to know how to use it. What would you say Eckhart is? The ribeye. Eckhart is the ribeye. <laughs> yes. Frequency holder. Frequency holder. What else is he? Example of presence. Example of presence. Okay, so let's break down the BS. Did Eckhart Tolle invent the power of the now? No. no. Okay, where did, where did a lot of those ideas come from? The Bible. The Bible. Came from things like the Tao Te Ching, came from Buddhism, came from the East. That stuff's been around since forever. So Eckhart Tolle is riding off of that wave. So what is it that Eckhart Tolle did that was different from, say, the Tao Te Ching or the Bhagavad Gita? What, do you, what did he bring? that was unique or interesting. What did Eckhart Tolle bring that's unique or interesting? Go ahead. It translated in English, plain English, that's understandable by everyone. Yeah, so Eckhart Tolle translated in, in, in a very understandable method, a way to understand the Bible, a way to understand the Tao Te Ching, a way to understand the Bhagavad Gita. He translated that 
in a manner where you have a basic level key to go look at sacred text. And he did so in a way, and here's the key, the key to the whole thing, in a way that has depth, but also in a way that has breadth. How many people do you see that can teach something that advanced and that abstract, but to that wide of an audience? Now, to be fair, I've been to Eckhart Tolle's events, and some of them are Eckhart Tolle playing the Pharrell Williams song, because I'm happy, because I'm happy, right? And you can tell that a very large percentage of that audience would rather sing the Pharrell Williams song than learn a lot of these abstractions. You can tell that. So it is an audience of a lot of copers. There's a lot of copers that are looking at Eckhart Tolle. The copers, what does the coper actually want? What does the coper want? Freedom from pain. Relief. They want relief. They want freedom from pain. They don't want enlightenment. They don't want access to a transcendent dimension. They want to just be happy. They want to stop hurting. That is probably the vast majority of people that are reading Eckhart's stuff. That's fine. That is what it is. What's the average person reading the Bible? They just want to join a cult. We already know that. They want to join a cult, right? That's how you know because I'll, I'll, you know, I, I'll talk about the Bible and people come up to me and they're not like, they don't want to talk about anything deep in it. They're not, they're not coming to say hi to me from a transcendent state. They're not present when they come say hi to me. They're not engaging with me in a level of any depth. They're just trying to get me to join their group think. They've clasped it on the group think. And so, you know, they'll say things like, I've been say I, my Lord and Savior is Jesus Christ. And literally when I see this, I'm like, I think you're gonna go to hell. <laughs> I'm a, you look like you're someone whose soul is gonna go to hell. Why? You're, in, you're doing the opposite of what Jesus said. You're completely and utterly in group think. You're, and you're alienating people from ever reading the Bible because you look like a turd. So obviously you're going to hell. So the average person that says like, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, that's called a bargaining spirituality. That's called I have no understanding of what I read at all. I'm scared. I'm run by ego consciousness. My ego is afraid of destruction and my ego believes that if I say these words that I get to continue after I die. That's all that they're saying. They're not saying anything else other than that. They are pushing people away from God. They are pushing themselves into hell and that's where they're going until they actually change. And by the way, nobody wants to call that out because they say it's insensitive. It's insensitive to say that. It's too scary. It's too scary. So they don't want to call that out. I'm not telling anybody to be scared. I'm just saying to use your freaking brain. You can choose to start using your brain right now, right away. So again, we look at Eckhart Tolle. It's Eckhart Tolle is not, I need to teach you how to think here, okay? Eckhart Tolle is not Eckhart Tolle. Eckhart Tolle is a guy who found a bunch of different uh, ideas and ideologies from many years ago, and then he did so much meditation, and he himself became a living example of those ideas that he's able to transmit those ideas by his very existence and presence itself. So he's a, he's a living example of that dimension, and he's somebody who can speak to the derpers while still having depth. That's ultimately what Eckhart Tolle is. So, You've got to be, you've got to, anybody who you look at, you've got to be kind of stripping them down and then saying to yourself, what is the, what is the, lar what is A, what is, the, repeat after me, what is the larger context of this person or thing? Say that. What is the larger context of this person or thing? Next is, what is the core value of this person or thing? What, what is, is the core value of this person or thing? So basically what you do is you walk through life and then you see, you have the ability to see right through people and see right through everything. So for, like, let me give you an example. The Democrat or the Republican Party in politics. What is that at a core fundamental level? The Democrat or Republican uh, parties in politics? That's called retail level politics. Repeat that after me. Retail, retail level, level politics. Like, I'm a Democrat. I'm a Republican. That's called retail level politics. Nobody at a high level in politics really believes it's like Democrat, Republican. That is retail level politics, okay? That's for the derpers. You think, okay, do you think when a bunch of billionaires get together that they're complaining about political party or race or any of these things that regular people get separated on? No. Do you think so? No. You think that the, the things that the average person is being separated on in the media, do you think a billionaire, a group of billionaires is sitting there going, well, I'm, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, you know, I, I'm a white, yellow, brown, whatever guy. You think a bunch of billionaires are talking like that? 
That's distinctions. That's retail level distinctions so that the derpers can sit there and argue so that the people at the top can stay at the top. That's all that it is. Okay? That is all that it is. So when you get, when you, okay, so Democrat, Republican, and, and the thing is, is that you can even look at a politician, you know, and, and people are like, oh, I want this politician to get in, or I want that politician to get in. And you've got to understand who it is that you're dealing with, what is their level of personal integrity, who are their donors, and who are their backers. Um, to what extent are they willing to go against the group think? To what extent are they willing to get unelected to, to be able to speak out for something they believe in? To what extent are they compromised? You've got to be able to understand all of that. You have to know what it is that you're looking at and see just past the surface level facade, okay? How about America? America, talk, we talk about say the freedom movement or patriot movement and you think about that, right? America right now is less and less what we would traditionally think of as America and soon will not be America, okay? America currently is basically just the, re I don't mean to scare you, scare you, it is, you saw 2020. It is the retail version of what we, I can feel the room's getting scared. You should wake up, okay? The retail version of America, okay? So basic level ideas. What is America? On some levels we could say rugged individualism, not just relying on some big bubba in jail to control your life taking personal responsibility and, and actually valuing your freedom over basic level convenience. Does this country right now value personal autonomy and freedom over having things handed to us? What do you think? Okay, so America at its core, which is based on a flawed, but ahead of its time, and in my view, holy document, but flawed, which is the Constitution. By the way, what was the problem in the Constitution? What's the flaws in the Constitution? Did that include everybody? Did the Constitution include everybody? No. Right? Did it include everybody? No. Okay, so there's a problem there. But was it ahead of its time? Yes. yes. That's all you have for the Constitution? Pathetic. That's how you speak. Look how you speak about the Constitution. I ask a basic question like, was the, like, your entire rights that you have right now is based on this. Was it ahead of its time? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh. <laughs> Okay, so it's ahead of its time. What did it do? It laid the foundation for, for getting us closer to freedom so that everybody could eventually be included. Didn't get us all the way there, right? But it laid a foundation. So from that standpoint, um, if, we view, if what we view of as America, as people who value their autonomy more than being given stuff, if, okay, because I want you to think about it like this. Freedom at its core level, right? At a core level, imagine that you're bowling, okay? And the lane is like, say, this wide. So you have a number of different options of how you can roll the ball down the lane. What happens when th those options get like this? Then they get like this. Then they get like this. Then they get like this. At what point are you actually bowling? You're not bowling anymore. At a certain point, you're just, you're rolling a ball down a predetermined little path. You're not playing bowling anymore, right? But what if bowling's kind of dangerous though? Well then where do you stand on that continuum of freedom or safety? What if you rolled the ball the wrong way and it could really hurt you? I have a completely torn ACL. I chose to do real skiing at Vail and completely shred my ACL over doing, you know, fake skiing in a video game. Let me ask you a question. Would you choose to do real skiing and risk having your ACL shredded like I did? Or if you could get the exact same experience in the metaverse with no risk of getting killed, what should you pick? Everybody here saying the ski thing. What about when you're sitting on the side of the hill, screaming, excruciating pain? This is gonna be a vicious, brutal surgery, excruciating pain. I'm probably gonna have to do oxy to get past it, by the way, which I'm super pissed about. And then from there, um, you know, in the first couple of days, and then from there, um, it's gonna be a nine to 12 month rehab on this knee, okay? Although I see, it seems to be healing on its own, which is freaking me out. So I might not have to do it, but you know my point, okay? I probably do, but we'll see. So. Knowing that, and, and, and the surgery is like, you know, I'm gonna do the same surgeon that Tom Brady used, so that's probably gonna be 30, 50K, okay? So knowing that that's the case, would you still pick, would you pick the, the, the virtual skiing if it was the exact same or the real skiing? Real skiing. Real. real. Y'all say that now? Most of y'all in this room already have never even been to Yosemite, you've never been to Sequoia, you've never been to Zion, you've never been to Catalina Island. A lot of y'all have never even been to the Getty Museum. 
You're literally living in a crappy digital simulation right now here in LA, but you think that you'd pick the real skiing. And so that'll be a thing that's gonna come up as well. But see, this is an even larger thing to consider, and let's go deeper on this, which is what is a human being? Because let me break down human beings for you. You wanted me to break down human beings a little bit of what you are? Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Rationalizer, liar, selfish, pathetic, nasty little worms who literally would let 2020 happen and just sat there and it was all cool. Okay, it was all cool. And so what you, what you have is, what do we do as human beings? We have something called narcissistic defenses. Holy beings. Holy beings. We'll get back to that. Who said that? Well, I'll get, we'll get back to that. So the idea being the average human being is potentially could be called a disease ridden chunk of biomass. Pollutes the earth, over consumes, spaced out, in a trance, and we have this thing that I call RAS flips. An RAS flip, if you've never heard me say it, is this idea that if this is the full picture of what happened, Great. let's say that somebody was nice to you, okay? And let's say, that if, let's say that 99 interactions with that person were positive, but you can benefit selfishly by screwing them over. It's part of the human brain to switch your perception, do this thing called splitting, and to make you focus on the one bad thing they did to justify you acting selfish. And human beings do this all the time. So low integrity little creatures filled with germs, polluting the earth, consuming, but on the flip side, we have intelligence and we have self-awareness. So when you're watching all these different movies, the general idea of these movies is that a human being is that life has value. Life has value. You know, oh, there's a, a kid's going to get killed. Life has value. But I don't think that we have a real narrative for why that is. And I think that narrative is slipping as quickly as the, as the narrative for freedom is slipping. Why does a human life have value? Because what is about to come out probably in the next, could, could be next year, could already be invented, probably be in my kid's lifetime. What's about to come out? AI. 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 Say it louder, guys. AI. What's coming? Metaverse. AI. AI, metaverse. Robots, you already seen those creepy ass robots that run around? No, shoot people. <laughs> yeah, what they're saying in San Fran now, the robot could shoot people? Yep. Is there a human monitoring it? Don't know. Probably just. Uh, we should look that up. Okay, so, all right. So we basically have a, we basically have this creepy dystopian future. Lockdowns, robots, AI, metaverse. That's where we're going. Okay? So now what we've got to say is, what value does a human being even have? What do we even have? See, once the AI is running things, why would the, the AI just looks at humans and says, this is how many humans are appropriate for, for the planet, and then this is how many there should be, and basically just view us as a zoo animal. We have warmth and energy that you can't get from AI, and it's irreplaceable. Yep. But does the AI really care? No. Does the AI care about the average derping, consuming TikTok watcher smoking a joint? Nope. So you have to understand the future self-help, the future personal growth is not going to be the me, 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 me. It's me. I'm getting rich. I'm in a business. I'm super cool. I have abs. It's me, 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 me. Okay, that's not going to be the future of self-help. Because the value of human beings is going to get called into question by machines that are able to see past the basic level surface. That's already going to happen. So that being the case, you better start to think of what a human being is. You better start thinking about it. What is a human? You better start thinking about it. Because you're about, you're, we're going to have to figure this out pretty quick. Think about how inferior our memories are. 
Now maybe we can create things, but what happens when a computer can create things faster than we can? Now go back to the fact that the average human being doesn't even care about truth or authenticity or freedom. They care about minimizing friction, minimizing work, and minimizing pain. So if that's the case, when a human is offered, oh, you can just get plugged into this stupid metaverse thing, how many humans are going to say no? But then once you, and, but once you get plugged in there, now you're plugged in. What's the world going to look like? Just a bunch of people with an intravenous thing into their arm with a weird screen on their face? And why would the AI even keep a bunch of that alive? Energy. What's that? Yeah, but like, unlike the Matrix where humans were at least some cool battery, I don't even think we're going to have that. We're not really a battery. So you better start thinking about what makes you valuable. And... In my view, personally, I think a major thing that makes us valuable is that we have the capacity to have a soul. So that's a big one. So you might want to start thinking about what that is inside yourself. We also have the capacity for incredible growth, and we have incredible potential. And what's funny about this is that we don't really explore that. So I think the future of personal growth is going to be much, much, much about getting in touch with the core essence. And I think the future of personal growth is going to be getting into actually seeing our real potential. And I think you're going to see a, a, a sort of the wheat cut from the chaff. I think you're also going to see America um, as being something similar to the book of Exodus, where a very, very, very small group of people leave the sick system and they have to find a new home. I believe that's, that's why that's the second book in the Bible. Because I think what's going to happen is going to be a very, very small group of people and what's going to happen is they're going to be like, I don't want this. The system is sick. I don't want this. I don't know if that'll be in my lifetime, but I've prepared my kids to make the right choice. I also believe, and I've met Ray Kerr as well, I believe that what's going to happen is that they're going to say, you can get plugged into this stupid cloud. And that people will be duped into believing that that's the extension of their life. And it's not. Okay? Because at a core level, what do we know about the soul? How is the soul created? We've already been given that. We've already been taught this in the Bible. How is the soul created? By God. How do we have our second birth via pain and surrender? Okay, crucifixion. So we have. So the second birth is triggered via pain and via surrender to pain. It's triggered by pain and surrender to pain. Okay, and then from there, surrender to absolute higher values. So let me give a simple example, okay? When I'm on the Tim Pool show, and then they say, um, you know, would you give back, uh, because there was, I was on the Tim Pool show, and they were talking about how uh, the guy from H3H3, what's his name, Ethan Klein, who's made nasty videos about me, I don't mind, um, and, and uh, Kathy Griffin, okay? So they're talking about how, um, you know, they lost their accounts, and would you give them back, if you could? Tim was talking about that. I said, of course I'd give them back. And Tim's like, no, I would not go to bat for them because they've gotten a bunch of other people canceled. Tim's argument at its surface is probably the correct argument. So why did I say, no, you have to give it back? What does it say? Very simple, and I just happen to agree with it. I don't just believe it because it's in a book. I happen to resonate and agree with it. What is it? Who here's, who here's read the Sermon on the Mount? Put your hands up. Okay, so look at all the dumb crap that y'all have read in your life, and, you have, and, and most people in the room have never even read the Sermon on the Mount. So one of the ideas in Sermon on the Mount is that you don't just forgive people who you like or help people who you like. You forgive people who you don't like. You help people who you don't like. Okay? So if it says it right there, people will say they're a Christian as an example. You don't need to be Christian to, to align with this. But they'll say I'm a Christian, but then they're getting mad at somebody who did them wrong. Well, if you're getting mad at somebody who did you wrong, what does that mean? That means that you're not listening to what's being said. So why is it so vital that we forgive people who did us wrong? Why is that so vital? Yep. You stop the cycle of it happening, like continuing, like... Yeah, so what he says is you stop the cycle. Anyone want to expand? There's a couple of different reasons, but who here wants to expand on that reason? Yep, and talk loud. It takes up mental capital. Louder. It takes up mental capital. Burns your mental capital, yep. What else? Low vibration. LVE, what else? Um, so... 
Louder, 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 louder. Yeah, so, uh, just forgive them for they know not what they do. Yeah, okay, so in other words, people are possessed by that energy, and so don't identify the person as the energy that possesses them. What else? When you hold on to that energy, you're burning up time and energy capital. When you hold on that energy, you're burning up time and energy capital. What else? Come on! Why do you have to forgive? What else? A light in him as well. There's a light in him as well. Yep. Okay. Here's the other reason too. Right. Where do you? What's that? We don't have the right to judge. Well, you know, I'm very aware that people can be assholes, but the point is, is that I'm still going to forgive because I can be an asshole. So the idea is that you don't judge the chip in your brother's eye when you have a plank in your own eye. Okay. And so the point being is this: you can you can rest your awareness at the level of physical body at the level of ego or at the level of soul. At the level of soul, you're an infinite being, and at the level of soul, you're not offendable, okay? So when we live in a grievance culture, where is that meant to situate the psyche of the person? It's meant to put it in the ego and in the body. So it's also meant to cut them off from God. Now, when you think about media, again, we look past the surface level of everything. By the way, Fox News, CNN, retail level media. Okay, if, you're watching, if your main source of news is CNN or Fox News, and there's great reporters on it, I'm not condemning them all. But if, if your main source of news is that, again, you're in retail politics to the highest degree. When, when you're seeing that somebody offended you, right? You're, are you seeing that at the surface of, I'm offended, I'm offended. Okay, that's the surface. See past the facade. Okay, see past the facade. If you're connected to your spirit as an infinite being, can you be offended? No. So you wouldn't care. Do you have scarce energy? No. Do you have scarce time? No. You actually don't. You because, and the reason why is because you know there's something past this. So as a result, you say, you know what? You're my enemy, I forgive you, and I'll try to help you. What you're doing is you're connecting to the soul, and as a result, when you do this, okay, go help somebody that did something nasty to you, what you're going to experience is a spiritual download more intense than almost anything you've ever seen in your entire life. It's very, very, very intense. So go do it. So let's see past, let's go past the surface level of somebody offending you. Oh, someone offended you. Someone was your enemy. Somebody was mean to you. What is that actually going on? What's actually going on? Mean. Hitting a trauma, but what's, up? what's actually going on? You have sick satanic energy. That sick Luciferian energy wormed its way into this person's psyche. And the way that it amplifies itself is by using you as a reverb to, to get you to act like that and to trigger you. And then to go like that and shoot up, right? So understand that person has no clue what they're doing. They're unconscious. Okay, that sick energy got you. It got them, as Chappelle would say, right? Got you. It got them. And so, and now it's attempting to use you as a reverb. So who's your actual enemy? Is the person, your brother, your sister, who at some point you're related to, is that your enemy? No. It's what's running them. But the thing is, you can't beat that energy by fighting it. If you fight it, what happens? Then you win, then, or then it wins, right? Maybe you'll win. <laughs> Freudian celebrity, yeah. Then you win. So then that energy wins because it got in you and it, and it amplified, right? So you want to get your psyche a little bit more like my kid's Tristan psyche, right? Clean, clean, untouched, pure as can be. It won't be pure, but pure as can be. So what does that beautiful, beautiful psyche look like, right? Again, we talk about the ribeye, the beauty of life. A beautiful psyche is one that is not polluted by anger and hatred and self-obsession and ego and idolatry and smallness and contraction and the me show of me, 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 me. It's not, it's not infected by that. So instead, where your psyche is, is it's beautiful and pure as you're able to get it and doesn't take yourself too seriously and has joy and can move through life smiling and happy 
and joyful. And then from there, making lots of money, helping other people to make money, being prosperous, helping others to be prosperous, taking in the beauty of the world, helping others to take in the beauty of the world. And basically somebody who is um, uncharging all that sick energy and instead is a conduit for positive energy. How do we summon down that beautiful positive energy and add that into the world? We've seen this in many different sacred texts. One of it is to love life for the process, not the result. Now, I love Timothy S. Grover. I have written extensive notes on his books and posted them on YouTube. I have met Timothy S. Grover briefly, and that is a more competitive kind of philosophy. One of my heroes, Kobe Bryant, his coach was Timothy S. Grover, and Timothy S. Grover basically says that even if you hate it, you do it anyway because you like the result. The way that you want to think about that is that you have a competitive paradigm like Russian dolls. So there should be a part of you that is aggressively, aggressively competitive, but that is not the only dimension of who you are. So that is something that you can access, but it's not the only dimension of who you are. Then you have a, you're multidimensional and you have another dimension. So it's okay for Kobe to go into a basketball game and rip his opponent's hearts out. But he should do so by mastering his craft. And as a result, that natural competition compels others to be better. So competition is actually how our DNA improves itself. You want competition. That's why I'm pro-capitalist. I like to be competed against. I want to be competed against fair and square. And I like to compete. That's all fine. But then there's also another dimension to you. And so that other dimension says, when I help an enemy, that's accessing a transcendent dimension. Likewise, when I just love the process itself, you're accessing a transcendent dimension. Why is that? You're not thinking about the outcome. Yes, you're not thinking about the outcome. So but why are you accessing a transcendent dimension when you just love the process? Why? You're pressing the moment. OK, if you're infinite, in the moment. If you're infinite, yeah. you what is the outcome, guys? Don't give a shit. Yeah, think, yeah, yeah. Outcome. You've got the gist of it. Yeah. You, don't, you wouldn't care. If you're infinite, then what outcome is there? If you're infinite, so you're just complete right, right now. what outcome? If you live forever, what outcome is there? Just the experience of it. There is only the joy of the dance. There's no one move in the dance that's the win. There's only the joy of the dance. So if you're that deeply connected to the present, you are connected and, and that deeply connected to the process itself, you are connected to that component that is infinite. And so what happens is that you'll open up that dimension of yourself and you'll sink into it and you'll access that. That is what it means to be connected to the process itself. Why is it that giving is another component of the infinite? Abundance. It's coming from absolute abundance. Infinite connection to everything else. Infinite connection to everything else. Absolute abundance. Absolute expansion. And it's connected to the energy of life. So giving is another spiritual practice. So being connected to the process just for the process itself. And giving are two examples of spiritual process. Another one. What do we see in Tristan? When Tristan runs to the front of the room and back. Maybe we could grab him again. Hey, let's grab him again. He's probably asleep by now. Let me just, okay, I want to I ground this for you, okay? So let's look at a baby, and, he, and he's still connected to the energy of the dimension he came from. So when Tristan runs to the front of the room, is he running to the front of the room in this very transactional kind of mechanical fashion? How's he running to the front of the room? Okay. So if I take Tristan Runyon, we, we hike Runyon a lot, right? You guys know Runyon Canyon here in LA? Yeah. So if I take Tristan Runyon Canyon, you can't just get Tristan to aggressively power. Let's get the ca camera, camera, camera. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay, let's get Tristan, okay? Okay, Tristan, come on up here, buddy. <laughs> Hop up. Say hi. Hi, Dad. Hi. Say hi, Daddy. Hi, Daddy. 
<laughs> Say, I love you. I love you. I love you. Okay, could you guys clap for Tristan? Okay, I'm gonna get you to repeat back. I'm gonna get you to repeat back what he says, okay? Okay, Tristan, stand up, stand up. Okay, say hi. 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 Say hello. 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 Say I love you. I love you. I love you. Say I'm Tristan. I'm Tristan. I'm say, I'm going to be the president. i be the president. Now say, you're going to be the president. You're going to be the president. Say, I'm the man. I'm the man. You're the man. Say, I love you. I love you. I love you. Okay, now go there. Okay, we'll hop down. Okay, go see Dylan, okay? Yay. <laughs> so when you see him running, okay, when you see Tristan running, He's hopping, he's smiling, he's running. So he still has that dimension that he came from, from beyond the veil. He's still connected inside of that, okay? The point being is he still has that dimension, um, you know, inside of him, right? So as he's running up, he is not going to be interested to power his way up to the front, get up here quickly and promptly, get to the damn point. Is there a place for that? Yes, 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 yes. Same as I told my team, go get my kid. And I'm like, yo, hurry up, okay? So there is a point. But why is it that Tristan is gonna, is gonna enjoy the run up to the front? Because he's connected to the infinite, still, right? At a very older age for a baby like that, okay? That's like, he, he's, he's carried that with them longer than I've seen. My other two kids carried that with them for a long time too, but he's really taken that with them. So, the idea being is he's going to be playful as he comes up because there's no outcome to actually get to. Each step is the outcome. So another shift in, th so remember what we said. One thing you can do is you can connect to the process itself. Another thing that you can do is be giving. Another thing that you can do is to be playful. Say the word playful. playful. So in other words, when I'm up here joking that Eckhart Tolle is going to be my boyfriend, <laughs> that is viewed at a surface level as non-spiritual, right? right? That's actually spiritual. Yes, joking that you're gonna sit outside Eckhart Tolle's trailer <laughs> and become the little spoon is actually more spiritual than saying namaste. Namaste is non-spiritual. Joking that you're gonna be the little spoon with Eckhart Tolle is spiritual, okay? Why is namaste the opposite of spiritual? Mechanical. Mechanical, performative, ego-based, playing a character, groupthink, group a tribe, being superior to the non-spiritual people who don't know what namaste means. <laughs> okay, so why is joking that you're going to be the little spoon with Eckhart? Why would that be a more spiritual exercise than the namaste? And Eckhart will admit this, by the way. Why is that? I believe he would. <laughs> who knows? What's that? Laughter. Because it's a joke. What are the most spiritual things that you could ever create is a joke. Not taking yourself too seriously. Look, you got to admit, it's a little weird for me to be a 43-year-old man, okay, sitting, and again, my, my kids leave the room when, when I say these filthy jokes. So, for people at home watching. So, it's a little weird. Imagine being a 43-year-old man. People have flown in from around the country to come and learn from you, and, and you're going to post this. How many teachers, you know, that have the, the reach and audience that I have, post jokes like being the little spoon for Eckhart Tolle? <laughs> They're not going to do it because they probably take themselves too serious, and then they communicate and interact with other adults who also take themselves too serious. So there's a financial, because let's be real, right? What's the, what's the best market? What's the best market? It's other upper middle, it's the mass of other upper, upper middle class adults. Look, here's the characterization of it. Um, they are like late 30s to late 40s. They've got a couple kids. And as a result, they have like a good six figure income. And as a result, they can afford to pay for stuff. So as a result of that, if that audience controls the money, then that's incentivizing other teachers to connect with that kind of an audience. That's the incentive structure. So 
the average person who has a couple kids, do you wanna know the main thing that they're operating under, their main, their main kind of like driver? It's just to eliminate friction. Just say whatever you gotta say to keep your head down. Eliminate BS, watch your sports game, and drink your wine. And now that, you know, in this next generation, smoke a little weed. That's what it is. What happened to most of my friends? How many, who here's uh, over like 35? Put your hands up, who here's over 35 in this room? How many of you guys notice that most of your friends by now are getting to a point where even if you tell like an off the wall joke, they kind of look annoyed. Like you're like, whoa, why are you, why are you saying these jokes? You're gonna see that around, around 35, your same crew who you could tell the most obnoxious, hilarious jokes with, you do those jokes in front of them and they're kind of, and they'll be like, Haha, I, I, you know, I don't want my boss to hear me laughing at this. I don't want my boss to hear me laughing at this. Like, I don't need any friction. I don't want any controversial opinions, okay? Why don't you go say, people talk about having courage, okay? I would love to ask Kim Kardashian, what are your three most controversial opinions that you believe could get you in trouble, but that would help the world if they understood? Imagine in the world, we said that every single person has to have three controversial opinions that could get you in trouble, but that would help the world if you shared it. Now people will attach themselves to causes that were genuinely controversial and dangerous 50, 70 years ago. And they will behave as if those are not corporate approved and, and as if those are not the most tame opinions to have now. So for somebody like me, what I, with my kind of thought process, when I see somebody giving a corporate sanctioned viewpoint. What does that look like in my mind when I'm seeing past the facade? I'm looking at a drone. I'm looking at somebody who's asleep. Now by the way, somebody who goes against every corporate sanctioned opinion, I also view as asleep. I was not a fan of Kanye's recent interviews, to be honest with you. I don't know what this guy was saying. I'm open-minded to try to understand it and I don't get it, okay? Maybe there's something there. I don't know what this guy said. All that it looked like to me was he was just trying to go against the grain to go against the grain. That's what it looked like to me. And I love his music, and I bump his albums, and I fuck Kanye, okay, as far as like the music side of it. But I don't know what the hell this dude was saying. There's probably something in there that I don't understand, but I don't really know what it was, and he didn't connect it to me. That's the big problem is whatever he's trying to say, I don't get it. So that's just going against opinions, just, you know, just going against it just for the sake of it. Why, why do you do that? And why do you, why do you also have to ruin it for people that are real original thinkers and associate them with you, okay? Like now what you're doing is you're associating original thinkers to that, like that's what independent thought is. And you're allowing it to be branded like that. Yeah, that's right. So you've gotta be able to look at a human being and when you see them, Ask yourself, to what extent could this person have their own point of view about things? And to what extent is this person a real autonomous human being? And to what extent is this person a drone? And by the way, drones in my view are the most dangerous force on the earth. Because psychos can basically weaponize them as their own stormtrooper force. And if you don't believe that, if you don't believe that, what does most of human history look like? Derpers getting weaponized by psychos. Most history is a long chain of derping, non-thinking, just following order losers saying, just following orders, I just followed orders. The Fuhrer says this as if authority means anything as far as ethics. But let's go deeper there. Remember I said to see through the veil? See through the surface? So if you think about it on the surface, when you look at authority, let, let's dismantle that. What do we know about basic level authority over many, many years? Okay, let's think about Aztecs, Incas. Okay, who here has ever seen Apocalypto? 
Okay. So how did they establish authority? They do their lame little human sacrifice thing. Fuck them. So what is, what is their version of authority? How do they establish it? Not just violence and force. What is a pyramid? What is a, okay, guys. Okay, stop your freaking brain now. Because if you don't know this, I feel so bad for you. What is the very first component of a sales ad? A hook. A hook. Then what do you do next? You establish authority. What did I tell you at the start of this seminar? Why I put out videos in a group? What am I doing? What am I doing? Why am I willing to lose money to just crank out videos in front of a crowd? Authority. I'm creating authority. Okay. So what is a pyramid? What is all these adornments, you know, a, uh, this cape and this crown and the jewels and the pyramid and the castle and the, and the, and the, and the emperor, whatever thing, what's that thing called? Like in Asia, the, the, you know, the big hut, help me out here. Palace. The palace. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So what is all that? What's the, pa why do they need a palace? Why do they need the pyramid? Why do they need the castle? Why do they need the rope? Why do they need the jewels? Why do they need the crown? What is that? Why does, why does the Vatican have jewels everywhere? Why? 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 What is a uniform? What is a police uniform? Okay. It's creating an unconscious response to create authority. Okay. So in other words, even for y'all now, you know, basic thing, like by the time that you're in your forties, you probably wear, you know, a little bit of diamonds. Maybe you wear a Rolex watch. Maybe you wear some nicer brands. Um, you know, that's basic level stuff in a modern society, right? But all that that is, is this kind of grandiose adornment that creates this kind of look of authority. And they do that to hijack your RAS, to hijack your critical thinking, and to turn you into a drone. That's all it is. These people have nothing on you at all. Okay? They have nothing on you beyond the actual authority over you, which would come from experience, which would come from some genuine form of moral authority. So when you think about idolatry, when you think about that, let's talk about how corporations build celebrity. So at a high level, if you're going to build a celebrity, they have to be very, very neutral. Common elements of a mouthpiece celebrity is um, loud, uh, prolific, and doesn't ask questions. Okay, repeat that after me. Loud. Wow. Prolific, Prolific. Doesn't, ask doesn't ask questions. So, you know, that's like uh, Justin Trudeau. So, okay, Canada's Prime Minister. My Uncle Ramsey wrote one of his, one of his dad, Pierre Trudeau's biographies. And they're friends. My Uncle Ramsey Cook. I used to be proud of that. So, his father, Pierre, was Prime Minister as well. So, um, if you have a celebrity, right? If that celebrity has a controversial opinion, that puts the corporation at risk of two things. Repeat this after me. Protest. Protest. Litigation. Litigation. Okay, you, you please listen. Okay, so you're a corporation and you're going to blow someone up huge, right? If they're too controversial, you can't blow them up huge because there could be litigation or there, or there could be protests, right? Like you could, have a, you could have a protest outside your corporate office or you could have litigation. So what you need is this dumbed down person who's not particularly special, who doesn't have any of their own thoughts. And then what you do is you uh, employ idolatry. And how do you employ this idolatry? See, human beings, when disconnected from God, are looking for God so bad. And so what happens is we look for God in ourselves and our ego. We look for God in celebrity. We're looking for God everywhere. So 
and, and that's called idolatry, okay? It's the golden calf. So Kim Kardashian is the golden calf. And, and make no mistake, that's what she is. And I like Kim Kardashian, by the way. I, I, I would, she won't hang out with me, I'm sure, but I'd be, why? Too controversial. But I'd be very, very happy to hear about, I'm sure she has a lot of interesting life experiences. Probably a good person. I don't know much about Kim. But regardless of that, what has Kim actually done? Okay, she banged Ray J. I mean, Ray J is kind of a stud. So she banged Ray J. Right? She built a brand. She built a brand. So good for her. She's done some good stuff. But what is particularly unique about her? What, what, uni what is Kim Kardashian? For, out of everybody in this room, give me Kim Kardashian's most unique or controversial opinion about anything. What is, what is, yeah, she, she dated a guy with BPD. So, yeah, Pete Davidson is known as having BPD. So, funny how the uh, trauma potential that a, someone has could uh, get them a lot of dating success. Now, okay, I disagree with that, but it's just funny how that works. Now, that's a truth bomb I just dropped on you that you should wake up to, yeah. okay? Layers upon layers upon layers of what I just came out of my mouth. Now, okay, although I, I think that's sick and not good. So. Going from there, okay, spoiler alert. The guy's BPD, look at his dating history. Think. Now, okay, now going from there, okay, going from there, it's called idolatry. Non-controversial, toes the line, so now you can, you can prop her up. That's idolatry, okay? So when, peop when people are looking at celebrity, it's just, it's just more what they call bread, what is that called, bread and circus? Is that the expression? Yep. Yeah. Bread and circus. What's the idea of bread and circus? It distracts. Anything to distract from that which is important, okay? So now, let's loop back to the media for a second. Okay, so, or no wait, almost done on the Kim point. So when I look at Kim, do I look at Kim as the surface level celebrity? No. What do I see when I see, like when I see a nightclub, I see free leads. What do I see when I see, when I see Eckhart Tolle, I see somebody who is a, an embodiment of old school Zen teaching taught in a pop culture way. When I look at a celebrity, when I look at Kim, what do I see? A brand oh, the of the established for the Somebody who is vanilla, and so here's how they build them up. A corporation, the way that they build them up is using two main things, or no, three main things, okay? Repeat this after me, reach, reach. production value, production value. social proof. Social okay, proof. like I'm, I'm giving you the keys to the whole kingdom here, guys, okay? You want like the forbidden knowledge that you're not supposed to have, you're getting it now, okay? So I've been behind the scenes. The things I've seen you don't even want to know. So again, what are the three things? What's the first one? Reach. Second one. Reach. Third one. Okay, so basically what you do is you find some compliant person from wherever, and then what you do is you put them on the radio, you put them on mainstream, because you're rich, so you can buy radio time. You're rich, so you can buy TV time. You're rich, so you can, brought, you can buy pre-reel ads on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have what's called reach. You can buy the exposure, okay? You can put Britney into everybody's ears. Who here has never heard of Britney Spears? Put your hands up. Okay, so you've all been violated. <laughs> Actually, I like Britney, I like Britney. But look what they did to her too, right? So, wake up. Now, okay, you know that, that whole idea of like the Aztecs, they would do human sacrifice, like they find some virgin and they're like, worship the virgin, worship the virgin. Everyone's like, yes, the virgin, the virgin. And then they human sacrifice her. It never ended, <clears throat> Britney Spears. Okay, it never ended. That's still happening now. <clears throat> Jessica Simpson, okay? So, okay, so you see where I'm going with this. Okay, build them up, build them up, build them up. No real support, boom, they go down. You don't even need to sacrifice them. We'll do it to themselves. Is that okay? We just saw Aaron Carter pass away. Just saw Aaron Carter pass away. Little brother from the Backstreet Boys. The Power Ranger guy just commits suicide. The Green Power Ranger's dead. Aaron Carter's dead. Oh no, just whatever. Let's not even, let's not think about that at all. Okay, so. No one did anything to them, but they're put in these positions that they're not built to process. Now, 
Or maybe someone did something, who knows. But anyway, you guys ever see the video of Anne, of Anne Hesh as she's trying to get up when they're wheeling her off? You ever see that? Anyway, let's keep going. So, I don't know what's going on there. I, I, I can only guess, I have no idea. So, okay, Princess Diana. I don't even know. I'm just talking shit. Anyway, so, yeah. I, have no, I don't have no idea you guys know there. But it's some weird stuff. So, um, what they do is they have the reach. They can buy the exposure. Then what they do is they use high production values. So they own the camera gear. So what does that mean in today's day and age? They own red cameras. They own Ari Alexas. They have the best lighting. They have the best editors. You can buy that. What's the third one? Social proof. So what you can do is you can actually just, you, you can literally just produce a crowd. You can literally, you could pay people to be a crowd. Or people want to be part of a studio audience. So I could take you, okay? And if I give, if you can just sing at a low level or dance at a low level or act at a low level, and then I put the reach in front of you, and I put the production values onto you with expensive gear, and then I put the audience in front of you, I can make you into a celebrity. So we tend to say, so what we say in personal growth is, the person who's at the top is you know, the most skilled. That's not necessarily always true. It's often somebody who's very, very compliant. One of the main hidden codes in the Bible is that by Jesus rejecting the system, he was persecuted and killed that the energy of sickness and of death and of Satan sees that real authenticity and beauty and light and wants to extinguish it. You ever been in a great mood as you walk down the street and maybe, and I'm not saying this is all homeless people at all, but you ever have where maybe a homeless person that's deeply, deeply disturbed sees you having fun and just naturally gets mad at you? You ever seen this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he sees you just biking by and he's just like, Ah, and he just wants to whip, right? Yeah. yeah, because he probably has the energy of Satan running him and, and he's offended by your presence and wants to attack it. It is natural that Satan and the energy of Satan wants to vandalize. I mean, take a kid like my kid Tristan, some, like that guy that whipped you would probably try to do the same thing to my kid, right? There's something that people that are possessed by that energy sees that beautiful innocence of my son Tristan and wants to vandalize it. That's the ultimate too, right? So, to a sick person, to a sick evil person, that's the ultimate. And it's, it's the most disturbing thing in the entire world, that one thing. Now, so when you see a celebrity, that's basically what you're seeing. When you're seeing a retail level politics, when you're seeing a retail level media, what you're just looking at is the system. You're looking at the system, it's drones of the system, um, so much of education, when we look at education or media, let me tell you another way to think about that. Is this freaking you guys out at all? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. So, okay. Everything is opportunity cost. Everything is opportunity cost. Repeat that after me. So, in other words, the, every second that the media covers this drivel, what are, what's actually happening? No, it's burning down opportunity costs of things that actually matter. Okay? Likewise, the way that things are taught, the things that get taught in the modern education system, for every decision, by default, you're choosing to not choose something else. Everything that gets taught to you, they're choosing not to teach something else. Everything in the media, they're choosing not to report on something else. So if we just use our minds right now, taking the media, what are some basic level things that the media could report on that would actually make a difference? News alert, y'all suck. News alert. You're all at 5% of your potential. Da -da 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 news alert. There's a recession, but y'all fucking suck. Y'all are lazy. Okay? Da -da 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 news alert. Y'all are eating Cheetos, and that's why your health sucks. 
So what they're doing is they report things as these like symptoms, right? Like you live in this low level paradigm, this low level trash garbage paradigm, then all these problems happen because of that. And then let's just report the symptoms. News alert. Some of y'all are idiots. And as a result of some of y'all being idiots, there's racism. Well, maybe then we should say, why are people idiots? And then you fix the problem. What is the solution to racism, in my opinion? Not being a fucking idiot. So my kids have Mexican. And you know what I tell them? Help create a world without fucking idiots. So, okay, are there smart people that are racist? No. <laughs> because if you're racist, you're an idiot. Okay? I don't care how smart you are. You're a fucking idiot. So the point being is like that, okay? So it's going at the symptom. It's not, it's not going at the cause. So it's, it's just this, it's this constant thing. It's this constant loop of keeping us where we're at by hammering into our psyche these things that are just making noise. It's just a bunch of noise. And if there's a great movie called, I've talked about this before, there's a great movie called The Irishman. And the whole point of the movie The Irishman is you watch Robert De Niro and he has this happen and that happen and this happens and that happens. But then the last third of the movie, it actually shows him as an old person. And basically, all the people that were around him have now died. His daughter won't even talk to him anymore. And there's no point to any of this. And so what winds up happening is that you realize at the end of the movie that his life was this flurry of action that amounted to nothing. And, that, and so much of what it is that we engage in in society is a flurry of action that results in nothing. So let's go back full circle to the ribeye example, getting the best out of life. The major, major way to get the best out of life, to get the ribeye, not eat the poop, is to ask yourself, is what you're engaging with creating some form of a lasting outcome or impact? Or is it not creating a lasting form of impact, but... It is a moment in time of great depth. So, simple story for that last one. It's a famous story. There's a kid, and the kid's on a beach in the morning, and the tide is pulled out, and there's a bunch of starfish on the beach, and the starfish are gonna burn to death in the sun. And the kid runs down, and he starts throwing the starfish back in the ocean. So the adult, in the adult's wisdom, comes and says, hey, there's millions of these starfish in the world that are burning. Don't bother throwing the, fish, uh, the starfish back in the ocean because you can't save them all anyway. The kid looks up at the adults like, this guy's an idiot, and then just keeps throwing them in. Why? Because the adult is thinking about some permanent outcome. The kid is thinking about a state of being. The kid is in a state of being, of enjoying life, and saying it's a beautiful thing to do to just do, to be the person that's throwing the starfish back in. It can't permanently solve everything, right? I can run around doing these events and teaching people and stuff. It's not gonna solve everything, fix every person in the world, right? But it's who you're being. So it's either who you're being, it's via the being paradigm, or it's something that's creating a lasting outcome. For example, for me, rather than going and giving money to a homeless person, I think a better form of charity is give $100 to a minimum wage worker that's busting their butt. Why is that? Because the minimum wage worker is proven they're not just an empty bucket who's gonna take the money, spend it on drugs, and then that's just an activity that's doing what? I'm not saying never to help the homeless. Go do that too. But I'm just making the point that if you give the $100 to somebody making minimum wage, that A is actually challenging you a little bit to give away 100 bucks. So it's gonna challenge your boundary a little bit. But B, that person might actually really put that you know, in some form to good use of something. So it's actually making a real impact. Another one that I've learned is like, don't help the average guy who doesn't want to help themselves. Don't have, help the average person who doesn't want to help themselves. Like, you learn over time, because I, I do a lot of pro bono help for people, 
but I do that pro bono work for people that are helping themselves. There's some people who just clearly are gonna take what you taught them and they're gonna run with it and they're gonna make something out of it and there's other people who are gonna sit there and they just like the attention and they, they, they just wanna soak you up for attention and it's not really going anywhere, okay? This is a uh, bad habit that I have in dating. Sometimes I'm dating someone who I'm very physically attracted to but I know that no matter what I'm gonna tell them, they're not gonna let it land, they're not gonna go execute on any of it. And so I tend to you know, favor like joking around and maybe an intimate moments, but I don't favor deep discussion because I can tell that they're fickle, I can tell that as soon as we break up, they're just gonna hate me anyway because they're not mature enough and they don't have enough object constancy to actually hang on to the good images that we shared and they're gonna do something called splitting and they're gonna take the good moment and make it bad because a lot of people do that with their exes. Notice how people talk about exes with disdain? Well, me knowing that people do that, why am I gonna sit there and put super duper amounts of time into deepening that relationship knowing that in the end that's what it's gonna be? I guess we could use the starfish example, but I just don't resonate with that entirely in those situations. So what I do instead is I just don't argue at all. Okay, I won't argue, and I just go to have fun. All that I wanna do when I'm dating someone is just have fun, have intimate moments, just go travel around. I don't wanna argue because I know that most relationships eventually do end, but a lot of people call that negative. No, that's called statistics. And I, I understand that. And, and, and there's a counter argument against that too. And I understand that too, okay? And so I know that. And so I know that if I'm dating somebody, I get it that the main point of it is the intimate moments and joking around. That's the only point mostly. It's not arguing because most couples argue and argue and argue and then they break up and then you lost all that time. It wasn't deep. It wasn't meaningful. It didn't amount to anything. I say this to all my exes. I'm like, baby, I'm like, I've said this to every ex. In the end, if we break up, you'll wish you had this time back. So let's just have fun, do our little thing here, and enjoy each other while it lasts, right? And they're like, ah, ah, no, yeah, you know all this stuff, but always when we break up, I'm like, remember I told you? Don't you wish you had all that time back? Now, what, now the negative view of that is like, you're, you're almost assuming that it's gonna fail, right? Well, I tend to be a growth oriented person. You don't attract what you want, you attract what you are. I'm always growing. So I get it that if I'm growing, the person who I'm seeing is not growing at that same pace. There's probably gonna be an energetic disconnect at some point. I understand that. I enjoy life. I enjoy meeting new people. I'm chill with all that. But I'm just looking for the ribeye. I'm looking to have fun. I'm just looking to have fun. Now, by the way, they call that not deep. You just wanna date someone and just have fun? You don't wanna argue and have deep, real conversations? You're not real. That's so not real. A real relationship, you have real fights because you care. I get it. There's truth in that in there somewhere. There actually is truth. The counter argument would be, you even just said yourself that you're assuming it's gonna end, right? So there's an argument that's there. But what you learn over time, okay, when you're 43 and you've been in different relationships, what you learn over time, all those arguments amount, think of a, for this room whole, this whole room collectively, what did all those arguments that you've all had with all your exes yield in the end? Burnt down time, wasted opportunity. And so as much as we can say, so we can say right now, I can challenge everybody in here now to give me some good things that came from the fights. You know, we learned about each other's traumas or something. Okay, cool. All right. Let's play the game of opportunity cost. Remember, what I say, everything's opportunity cost. What else could you have done? Instead of the 20% of the relationship that you spent fighting, what else could you have done? That's when you realize that with what else you could have done, that's when you realize how dumb it is. You could have been talking about how to benefit the world. You could have been talking about how to grow. You could have been talking about how to go on more vacations. You could have hooked up more. By the way, hooking up more, and having more fun, that's not superficial or shallow. That's what nobody gets. It's not superficial or shallow to want a fun relationship based on sex. You wanna know what's superficial and shallow? Arguing. Because is that argument really based on anything that deep? Or is it just you with your messy pain body that's acting up and you can't contain it and you in a low state of, gra of low gratitude, 
you're in a low state of gratitude. You have non-gratitude for the moment. And so as a result of that, you're going to burn down your time and you're going to burn down the moment arguing. Is that a ribeye? Is that you eating the ribeye? That is the poop of the relationship. You're bathing in poop. The average couple that's arguing is just doing so for the same reason that you bring people on a beautiful Hawaiian vacation and they stare at their phone. That's why they're arguing. It's not this super deep thing. They're lying. It's not super deep. Some arguing, yes. It shows that you care. Some. But it's definitely within a limit and most people are definitely going past the limit. It's like the uh, one glass of wine a day is healthy limit, right? And the average person can't stick to that. Okay? Well, a tiny little argument here or there could be okay, but the average person is not going to stick to that. And what happens, I personally found, you ever had it where you're in a relationship where the person wants to argue all the time and then by the end of it, it affects you and then by the end of it, you're making arguments like you look crazy yeah. because you become who you hang out with, right? So you'll see this in relationships where like, you know, you go into it with like that much mental sanity and they have that much mental sanity. And then by the end of it, okay, here's my diagram of mental sanity. And then by the end of it, they're here and then you're here. But then the best part is then you're not used to being there and you start to mess up your whole life and mess up your business. And then you go there and then they go there and then you flipped. Who here has ever had that happen to them in a relationship? Put your hands up. Have a, have a sanity flip. Put your hands up. I've had it where by the end of it, like I sound just look like a freaking crazy person. I'm like, how did I get here? Now, as soon as you break up, you go back to being sane, they go back to being crazy, and life is back to being good again. But I've, I've experienced that, you know, where I do things I'm not proud of. I'm just like, look at how I sound, look at how I'm talking. Well, I'm crazy, right? And that happens, okay? And that, they've actually proven that in studies. Um, it's called emotional dysregulation, and emotional dysregulation is contagious. So a lot of that fighting is just the person's emotional dysregulation looking to infect you. And so they'll say it's super duper deep. It's not. They'll say it's super duper important. Most of it isn't. It's just the same thing as somebody who is um, looking at their phone in a Hawaiian vacation. They can't handle the light. They can't handle how beautiful life can be. They can't handle how awesome life could be. And so they go into it. And again, remember I said you've got to see past the facade. You've got to see past the facade. So this is how you see past the facade of that. The reality is most of those relationships where the person loves to fight eventually are going to have a rupture and it's going to be very sad when it does. And then they're, and if that person loves to fight, they're going to find eventually someone who likes to fight with them and they're going to go do that all day till they rip each other's freaking hair out. And so what you'll find is you want to get out of those sooner than later. It's sad, but true. Emotional stability is one of the main things of eating the ribeye. But notice how many men, if you get a new girlfriend, for example, what's the first thing they ask? Is she hot? Is she hot might have validity if you spend an evening together. But it certainly doesn't have a lot of validity compared to is she sane? <laughs> or is he sane? And, and that there is going to be a much greater determinant of happiness. You know, can this person be a mother or father if you're going to have kids? So, you know, these are huge, huge things, right? The, my kids have never seen yelling. What kind of mother do they have to have for my kids to have never seen yelling, right? You've got to choose wisely. And you've got to choose somebody who doesn't worship Satanism unconsciously without knowing it, right? Worshiping arguments, groupthink, idolatry, time wasting, eating the poop, the way to understand that metaphorically is the energy of death. It is that the person at some core level resonates with the energy of death. And so you've got to begin to ask yourself, where do you resonate? Don't just look at the other person. Where do you resonate? When I look at the average uh, relationship advice on TikTok or Instagram, most of it is cope. Remember I said you've got to be able to see through the facade? Most of it is cope. I saw this uh, video today. There was some speaker. He was up there. Very inspiring. He said, you know what? Some people are just meant to be in your life for a season and you're like this rocket ship and you're shooting up into space and they're like the booster rockets and they just fall off and you go into space and there's like a thousand people in the room all clapping. Do you mean to tell me that out of all thousand people in that room that they're all the spaceship and all thousand of them had the booster rocket? <laughs> I'd love to know the, the stats on that. 
I'd like to have the AI come in, the future AI come in, <laughs> and give and give their little creepy like Amazon device thing where they spy on you. And I'd like to see a replay by the AI with the creepy Amazon device. What is it, what's the Amazon device called, the ones that spy on you? Alexa. Alexa, yeah, the creepy Amazon Alexa spy device. And for all the people like, I'm the rocket, or I'm the ship, they're the rocket, they just fell off because I'm going into space, woo! Okay, I'd like to see that. And how many then, them were argumentative, toxic, negative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they're using projection, and they're, and, they're, and they're basically just lying to themselves. So remember we say, don't judge the chip in your brother's eye when you have a plank in your own eye. So when I talk about things like poop eating, you know, I, I, I don't just sit there looking at other people call them a bunch of poop eaters. I have one of my most important habits, which is every time I see somebody else doing something bad, I just ask myself, where's my version of the same thing? Where is my version of the same thing? Okay? Now let me give a couple other examples before we kind of wrap up this topic, okay? A couple other examples. So the Conor McGregor versus Floyd Mayweather fight I think is another one of the great examples of just stripping things down to the core and seeing them for what they are. So do you guys remember the Floyd Mayweather versus Conor McGregor fight? Yeah. yeah. So what that was based on is that the average person is so spaced out that they don't even realize that Conor McGregor doesn't box. <laughs> So this is what marketers get. Like mar marketers are very, very good at just doing what's called split testing and they split test to see how dumb you are. They just keep split testing to see how dumb you are. So what a, mar what a marketer does is they're like, okay, Floyd mega popular, Connor mega popular, how dumb is the public? Can we just tell Connor to box? Floyd's basically retired, okay? Floyd, best boxer of his, of his weight class ever but basically retired, Conor McGregor, an MMA fighter. Now, Conor McGregor, he under, Conor himself has stripped down his understanding of things to realize he doesn't need to be the best MMA fighter to make the most cash. How, do you make, how does Conor make the most cash? Being oh, around. Swagger, being loud. He can still command those big paydays, right? And Floyd, he's retired. But he realizes the average person in the public doesn't care, so they're not limited by convention. Say the word limited by convention. Limited by convention. So they're not limited by convention. So what they do is they say, would the average person even really notice that this is ridiculous? Probably not. So then let's go put it on and let's make a ton of cash. Then they go do this marketing showpiece where they scream obscenities at each other, which the average people get pumped up by, and they go make a gazillion dollars. Let me put it to you even in another way. Would you have ever imagined when you're younger, do you remember when you're younger and it was all about heavyweight boxing? Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson, remember that? Would you have ever thought that lightweight boxing was gonna be more popular than heavyweight boxing when you're a kid? No. Did you know what, can you name a lightweight boxer from the 80s or 90s? <laughs> can you name a heavyweight boxer from now? No. Most people can't, right? So what do we see there? Again, like we see things within conventions, but it's really the personalities that drive it. There's, there's different personalities that drive communities. There's different personalities that drive marketing. So again, you always wanna be seeing great marketers. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to show you here how to make millions and millions of dollars. So great marketers and people that make a lot of money and people that wield a lot of power they don't see things at the surface level. Like if I have a supplement and the supplement's called Mega Energy and I give that to you, if in your mind you're going, I want to have Mega Energy, I'll take this supplement, you should, like if you ask me, I know 90% if not more, probably about 90 because there's some obscure ones, of what is in any, of, of any supplement, what it does, what is the mechanism, what are the possible side effects? What are the possible risks of it? What are the ups and downsides of that supplement? I understand whether it's Eastern herbs or whatever, I get what all that stuff is. So I don't just buy a supplement bottle called Mega Energy. Soon as I, soon as I see the bottle, you know, I, I pick up the bottle and I look at what's in it immediately. That is a metaphor for how you should be thinking about everything. What's actually in it and what is the driver of value? Even supplements themselves, you should be wondering where they're sourced from. 
Is it just a marketing shtick? Et cetera, et cetera. When you look at something like, say, Powerade, and they talk about that being a sports drink because it has electrolytes, what is an electrolyte? What else? Magnesium, what else? Potassium, right? What's the main ingredient inside Powerade? Sugar. Not sugar, that'd be great. Corn syrup. So it's corn syrup with probably sodium and potassium. That's what you're drinking. So, but, the, but again, the average person, they're just like, it's Powerade. You know, this basketball player drinks it. That's as deep as they're looking at it. So I'm trying to show you a thought process um, by which to look deeper. And maybe another final point too. You guys all know what the midwit meme is? The midwit meme is this idea that for a lot of things that are super duper deep, the dummies think the same thing as the geniuses. The dummies think the same thing as the, ge as, as the geniuses. So in other words, um, you know, the dummy looks at the Bible and he's like, Noah's Ark, yeah, okay? Then the average intelligence person is like, what? You know, right? Look at these idiots. I don't want to be like one of these idiots on the street, like the end, you're going to go to hell, like that. And then the genius is looking at the esoteric symbolism in the work and is able to understand it. That's the idea of the midwit meme. So there's many, many, many different things like that. So an example would be uh, be yourself, right? Be yourself, idiot. Be yourself. Mid-level mid, mid person, um, being yourself could just be you justifying your most negative, limiting behavior. You saying that being depressed is you. You shouldn't just be yourself. You should fake it till you make it. Higher level thinking person, wait a minute. After a 20 year journey of clearing the clutter, you realize that you should just be yourself. So it's like, be, so do you see how they take these ultra high level truths and then they shroud it in stupidity to take you away from the higher level truth, right? Or like, love will conquer all. Idiot. But it's like love, right? The best one is in these fake um, NGOs or these fake causes, and they'll call it like the love group, like things like that, right? Like, they're, like they literally realize that they can, they can hide communist organizations just by putting a, a thing on the outside of positivity on it, right? So then what they do is like, love will conquer all. Love, derp. Then at a higher level, you're like, you know, or at a mid level, you're like, um, love's not gonna conquer all. I mean, there's plenty of things horrible that happened that love didn't conquer. At the highest level, you realize that at, at the, the base level of the universe is the energy of life, which is the energy of creation, which is by a way of looking at it, the energy of love, and that that eventually conquers all. That's not really gonna solve your parking ticket. That's not going to solve the fact that, you know, you're, uh, you know, it's not, it's not going to solve um, the fact that, like, society is just on this, like, insane trajectory. But in the grand, infinite wisdom of the universe, as more and more planets get created, and there's planets all through the galaxy, there will be some other form of intelligent life that maybe some of them actually valued their rights and freedoms, fought for them, and they figured it out. You see where I'm going with this? So, not gonna really help you in your life, but you know, if you view yourself as part of that infinite consciousness and realize that the galaxy is so much bigger than we can even conceive of, Oh well, yeah, you know, there'll be some good stuff somewhere out there. So love conquered all. So, you know, so it, depend, it depends on how you look at it. Love does conquer all, but it depends how you look at it. It's a powerful truth shrouded. Now, let's go back to what we said about America. The values that we think of as America, at the retail level, we look at that as geography. But... The way that I would conceive of it, in my personal way of looking at it, is it's a set of principles. So, if Hong Kong is more America than America, that's America. Hong Kong just became America.
but you don't just get to sit here smoking weed, looking at TikTok, and letting what happened in 2020 happen, and then say that you're America. That's not how it works. So that has to be understood. You don't just get that, okay? My kids have to fight to be called Americans. You don't just get to be an American and say, oh, I'm cool with the fact that a billion people are enslaved in China. Yeah, it's cool that a billion people are enslaved in China and I'm an American. If you're okay with that, you're not American. So that, but do we ever talk about a billion people enslaved in a, in a country? No. When does that ever come up? Never. So what does that show people's prioritization of autonomy or freedom? And when you look at freedom, and let's look even past that, what is freedom? They, marketers can put branding around that. They can move the Overton window to say that what freedom means is freedom to do bad things. And that even the word freedom means that you're trying to block people from creating safety. They can brand it like that. Imagine how warped we've become that marketers can shift a basic word like freedom to where freedom is now viewed as possibly a bad thing. It's now possibly viewed as subversive. Imagine a world where freedom, the concept of freedom, could have been rebranded via the manipulation of the Overton window as subversive. Imagine that world. How passive and unthinking would a public have to be to do that? And yet that's called America? So see past the surface of anything. Now here's what I'm gonna wrap with. What is your life? What is your life? To what extent have you allowed the marketing in your life to predetermine how you plan to live this whole thing? You don't have to do anybody's plan. Just don't go to hurt anybody else. Don't hurt anybody else. Don't prejudge anybody else. View people in light of the content of their character. And don't hurt anybody. But even the way that you live your life, to what extent has that been predetermined for you? as far as your criteria of good or bad. What if you just scrapped all that and went back to zero? You know, they say in a, in a business, would you rehire your staff? That's another powerful question that goes outside of assumptions. Would you rehire your staff? Would you remarry your wife? Would you redate your girlfriend or boyfriend? Or Eckhart Tolle? Would you re-spoon with Eckhart Tolle? <laughs> would you be the big spoon this time? So ask yourself questions like that, right? These are, these are deep questions that you ask yourself. Do you guys know modern day marketers like Dan Kennedy? The way that they came up with so many of these ideas like long form sales ads and things like that, um, high ticket things, was they just, they got rid of assumptions and they just started asking deeper questions. So be somebody who's always getting rid of assumptions and asking deeper questions. I'm trying to show you how to build not just a million dollar business, but maybe even a billion dollar business here. Because I'm trying to show you how whole mold. I'm trying to show you how to, how to create a disruptive idea in business. But let's bring this back to your life. How do you disrupt your own life? See past this predetermined hamster cage version of life and start asking yourself, what is it that you want to get out of life? And not, many people can't handle that, right? They're not able to handle that. They need those predetermined ideas um, to think about how to live life. But what if you just wiped the whole slate clean? What if you just took the whole board and just flipped it upside down? Would you choose this again? To what extent would you choose the direction of your life now? Would you choose it again? Would you rehire this version of your life? Let me ask you another question. Would you spend as much time as you did watching TV? No. <laughs> would you spend as much time as you did eating junk food? Would you spend as much time as you did looking at dumb social media? Would you spend as much time as you did gossiping? Would you have rechosen all that? How many of your decisions in life would you have even rechosen? So how many of the decisions in your life was poop eating versus ribeye eating, right? So keep coming back to that as well. Keep breaking the mold, keep breaking assumptions, and keep re-examining 
your life. Train yourself not just to go with the laziness of the group think. Train yourself to have an independent eye. Train yourself to be the person that looks at the mega energy bottle and flips it around and says, what's in here? Train yourself not to be fooled by social proof. Train yourself not to be fooled by a big crowd. Train yourself not to be, viewed, to, to be fooled by um, adornments like a pyramid and a crown and a castle. And a, and a virgin sacrifice. Train yourself not to be fooled by dogma. Train yourself not to be fooled just because somebody looks like they know what they're talking about and speaks with conviction. I can speak with conviction. Doesn't mean I know what I'm talking about. Train yourself not to be fooled by the reach of somebody. Like, oh, well, they have a lot of people looking, so therefore it's good. Train yourself not to be fooled by the fact that somebody is just, you know, give it a green light by the establishment, when in reality, that might just be somebody who's loud, prolific, and doesn't ask questions. Anytime somebody can't give you a controversial opinion, if you say to somebody, tell me your most controversial opinion that, you know, you could get in trouble for, but you think would benefit the world, if they don't have an answer, they are a drone. If they don't have an answer, they are a drone. Or there's somebody who just values minimizing BS and minimizing friction. They may have those opinions, but they're not necessarily somebody who you should listen to. Their opinion means nothing because, they're not, they're, because their main purpose is not truth. Their main purpose is to minimize friction in their own lives. Their main purpose is the collective. Ask yourself what you change about your own life and ask yourself what is the value of a human being when AI comes in? What is the value of an experience when the metaverse comes in? What is the value of a lot of things as technology starts to change? When does a human stop being a human as we start adding robotics onto the human, as we start adding genetic alterations onto the human? When does a human start and where does a human end? Ask yourself, what is the real value in life? Because if we can't begin to figure out what is the real value in life, if we can't begin to figure out what is a, what is a human, then how are we gonna know how to live life with all the upcoming technological change? So we've gotta really, really understand what is human potential? What is a human soul? What is the purpose of human life? But you know what's kind of funny? A lot of these broader, bigger questions that are very, very, very intense, that are very, very powerful thought exercises, just little kind of ima exercise the imagination. Well, the AI is not here now, and that's still gonna be a minute. And the, you know, the dystopian future is not quite here now, although we've seen signs of it. We've had some of it recently, but it's not entirely here. We're getting a breather for now. You know, the boa constrictor's loosening before the next tightening. So if that's the case, these same questions can actually encourage you just to live a more fun life today. You can actually live a more fun life today by asking an even more intense question, by asking myself, what is my soul? How do I really want to live life? What is the real value of me as a human being? That is going to be of crucial value in the future perhaps, but it's actually of great pragmatic value today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you all do an exercise. You, this is the people that stayed up real late. See the crowd's thin a little bit. We had a long day today. But I'm gonna go into another segment after this that's gonna be very, very powerful and exercise based. I'm gonna be bringing people up to the front. But I want you guys to now talk to each other. And I want you to talk to each other about what your life means and what you got out of this talk. So take five minutes. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna sit at the front, but just let me rest, okay? Just let me rest. I'm gonna sit at the front. But everybody take five, 10 minutes to talk about some of the crucial questions that we discussed here in this talk. And then we'll come back and do more. Do you guys have fun? Yeah. 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 All right, well thank you guys very much, that was fun. Yeah.